I'm very happy to welcome Maria Mencia, who is uh, an artist researcher. I cited her, so you gathered that already. And uh, she is a course leader of the BA in Media and Communication at Kingston University uh, in the UK. Her PhD in Digital Poetics and Digital Art was one of the first practice-based research in the field of e-poetry. And she has continued to explore the poetic space in hybrid textualities of language, art, and digital technologies since her PhD. Her work has been exhibited worldwide, presented at numerous conferences, and it is published in the Electronic Literature Collection, uh, the first volume of the collection, uh, and the Anthology of the European uh, Electronic Literature. She's interested in collaboration and ha has been the recipient of various fellowships, grants, uh, to conduct research at New York University, uh, Melbourne, the University of Sydney, the uh, University of Technology of Compiègne, with Serge Bouchard, uh, and in Aarhus in Denmark. So her current publications include Gateway to the World, Data Visualization Poetics in Grammar, uh, which is a journal of theory and criticism, uh, uh, Elite Practice and Pedagogy, Interweaving Methods, Content and Technology in Digital Media and Textuality, published uh, by Transcript at Columbia University Press. And she is the editor of Women Techlit or hashtag Women Techlit. I'm not sure how you actually it's say the title. Today, <laughs> International Women's <laughs> Day. So it's hashtag Women's Techlit, very appropriate for today. Published by Computing Literature and distributed by West Virginia University Press. She was awarded second prize for the Anne Catherine Hayes Award for Criticism of Electronic Literature. And she's one of the team members of uh, Translating Electronic Literature, a transatlantic program in collaborative digital humanities which is running uh, uh, through uh, two years from uh, 2017 to 2018. I uh, hopefully will be continuing at some point. A research project funded by the fun uh, Fondation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme mm -hmm. and the Andrew Mellon Foundation. So plenty of lines to, uh, to connect with. And she has her website, uh, www.mariamencia.com, if you'd like to check out her uh, amazing work. Thank you, Maria. OK, thank you. Thanks very much, Erika for this really lovely uh, symposium that we're having and um, my afternoon slot <laughs> just after lunch. So in this presentation, what I'm going to do, um, because I realized that I hadn't met many of you, I thought I would <coughs> show you like a couple of uh, works, my, my earlier work as well, because it's really connected to the um, you know, what we are actually discussing here in terms of intertextuality and how this it all comes together. Uh, and perhaps there you realize why I was thinking that electronic literature is kind of, um, you know, interlinguistic um, in many ways, because that's what I was interested in, you know, in many of my works, it comes, it comes across. But, um, so the two works are from 2001, 2003. Uh, one is called Another Kind of Language, which is the first one that I started thinking about that other kind of language, whatever that was. And Birds Singing Other Birds Songs is a pretty well known uh, piece of electronic literature. And at the point when I was working on these, um, you know, these, these projects as part of my, my PhD, and they were outcomes of my research in practice base, um, there was nothing around that I could think that it was either similar or we didn't even have really a name for e-poetry when I started doing my, my PhD. We didn't know. And then later on in 2006, uh, the Birds Singing Other Birds Songs, it was published in the Electronic Literature Collection, but that was like six years later, really. So. Then after showing you these two works, I will show you some slides of my work as well. Just like a quick um, recap of some of the things that I have done. And you can always go to, to my website and have a look. And also there are very often or most of the time I have a written essay or a chapter, something in connection to that work as well. So um, yeah. So, ah, uh, yeah, and I will finish with my current work, the, the poem that crossed the Atlantic, the Winnipeg, yeah? Um, which Erika has been taking all these um, images from. So, I've been exploring these hybrid linguistic uh, textualities, sometimes through phonetics, 
I was very interested in phonetics and I have like a real archive of phonetics from different languages and um, you know I was very interested in the phoneme as the smaller unit of language but also being full of uh, signification or emotional signification in a way so and so I have used yeah I, I will show you the first one um, the another kind of language it has three different um, languages and is uh, with phonetic sounds from these languages. So some of the other works they have the translation from one uh, language into another but they are all dealing as well with um, the use of software or translation of code into other languages. So the cross fertilization is not just across the natural languages or the intel multimedia or multilinguistic but it's also across the code and the interface and across media um, and there is also in terms of the authorship I have been um, collaborating with uh, programmers especially in the last kind of seven years or something or eight years and I, you know I don't see the it's kind of authorship I find it quite a, a, an odd kind of uh, terminology in a way um, it doesn't seem to work for me for, you know, when you're working on electronic or multimedia projects uh, and everybody has like different roles and yes, I think in the way that is usually work out for me is that um, I, you know, I have an idea or I want to develop a project and then I try to find a programmer that might be interested in, in working with me and help me to realize that project is mainly working this way but um, but there is also a lot of co-creation as well because many of the works I have um, I've been gathering stories from different people or it's user generated like in the poem that crossed the Atlantic people can actually you know upload their stories and then this kind of develop into the actual poem um, the phonetic sounds, I've worked with lots of different language groups as well so you know it's not like I sit in there and write my own stories so it is it's interlacing a, a whole deal of uh, multimedia aspects and multimodal and translations and remediations of sorts and devices and everything so this is the first work that I want to show you another kind of language which um, uh, my main aim, and this uh, this kind of is across all my work, is this uh, explore this area of the in between the visual, the phonetic, and the semantic in this one in particular. Yeah, but always is this in between area of the visual and the linguistic, uh, and and this is very very important for me to create this kind of poetic space. And how do you actually translate a poetic space like that? in electronic literature is a bit of a challenge. So, yeah, so I mix different modalities, uh, sensory models and visual and auditory, as well as motion or animation. And with this project, there is a kind of illusion of semantic meaning to create this kind of in-between area of signification and experience of the work. And because people always try to put sentences together when they hear phonetic sounds, which I will do in a second. Um, so yeah, so then this is like the layers underneath of the work which you actually don't see. I was very interested in the different reading patterns and this was in 2000 years when I was exploring this, but the different kind of reading from on a screen, on an interface. And with this work conceptually is, is uh, you know, it's exploring that area of the, the new reader and how you read on an interface from left to right, right to left and uh, top to bottom and things like that. And that's why I selected these three particular languages, which was Arabic, Chinese and, and then the, a Western language, which uh, it was English in this case. Although I do have another um, work as well where I have Arabic, Hebrew and Spanish because uh, I, I actually reused this work to do another piece from uh, up in, to do in, in Zaragoza in Spain anyway and these were the cultures that were living together uh, in Zaragoza at some point. 
Also something you need to think is that I was also questioning always notions of electronic poetry, we have visual poetry, concrete poetry, sound poetics, and this comes up again in many of the works. So, and this kind of inability to hold the medium, to hold the image, to hold the sound <coughs> is also there. Yeah? And then the remediation of from, from analog platforms, the print, the voice, to the digital, yes, with the aim of uh, explore these new multilingual and multicultural poetics and spaces. So this is one of the works and first of all I'm going to actually uh, play this to you to put some sound. So you're giving a uh, white space and I was again in many of my works yeah, oh, it's not connected. this uh, Is it connected now? When I when I worked on this, I you know if you go online, then you work on this individually. But uh, what I always wanted to do it was, um, uh, and I did it in the installations that I had of the work. Is that the the three pieces are actually projected onto the same screen, so then different people are actually playing with that, and uh, then the the three languages come together there, and that is it was always the intention and it's always happening in the installation space. When I was researching on this, I realized that that particular software that I was using, because I had been using Directa before, and it allowed you for this, but with uh, Flash, uh, it was more complicated. So, yeah, so this one, when you are at home, or you know, on your own computer, they are individual uh, texts. But anyway, so those are the sounds. Um, now, before I actually go to the next work, I'm going to show you this one, um, and this is uh, it's called again. It's kind of this screen with nothing on it, and uh, unless the user does something about it, then nothing happens. So, and this one is called "Birds Singing Other Bird Songs." Yeah, so here again, bird singing of the bird songs. I was again very interested in the phonetics aspect of it. So I am going to show you this uh, um, view. So, so then I was working with uh, transcriptions. I don't know why something is gone in there. Um, the transcriptions of the birds. So it's the bird songs. Then you got the transcription of the bird song, and then the interpretation of those transcriptions by by people. So they have to read and they have to sing the songs of the birds. So it's again um, like the you know the humans and the animals and the machine because then the the the, the sounds that I collected 
I actually put it on through the computer and I also manipulated them. And then those sounds are given to each particular bird, okay? So the birds are singing the outlines of their own songs, but uh, they are singing birds of other, or songs of other birds, not necessarily their own, yeah? So that's why it's called uh, birds singing other birds songs, which is very much to do with my own life in a way, you know, and I'm here <laughs> singing in English even though English is not my mother tongue. So I was working on these kind of ideas and the kind of, uh, so then there is a transcreation process uh, from sound visual shapes of birds, the translinguistic uh, and transmedia. I mean the first, um, the first project I did, it was a video, so it was this uh, remediation from print and, and calligrams into the video and animation. And then from the video, I did the, um, this work that you just saw for the web. And then on the web, the birds just kind of flew everywhere in the world. And then from that one, I did another remediation when I had uh, an exhibition in Cuba, and they didn't have like a computer. So I did prints of the birds, birds, and I had a video on the prints. So these are many other translations as well that you know you find in the in the piece, yeah. And the idea of the sound poetry, and here there are some of the transmedia examples as well. Um, so this is a, it was a kind of creative methodology in a way yeah, of my practice based research and where it shows the fusion of the multilingual the cross cultural the multimodal and this kind of transcreative dimensions together with the possibilities also that technology offers to engage uh, uh, translation processes uh, by using different software or different devices and i think this has become quite clear in many of the works that i have done i have to do that um, just quickly now, I'm going to take you through some of the works that you can find on my website. But here again, these are generative poems. Uh, the only way that uh, it was again using the same uh, languages and um, uh, like in another kind of language. And this is called the alphabetic. And in order for these poems to appear, you have to actually um, speak or, or shout or speak really loudly and then they, they start appearing there. Uh, this one with Cityscape Social Poetics Public Textualities is a research project that I did in Melbourne and I also thinking about the another kind of language well uh, I work with many different languages groups even uh, with Aboriginal group as well that they were trying to bring up the, the, the language uh, alive again, and uh, it was called Wathaborum. And, and practically, what you in this one, what I was given, it was an empty place again, like an, a canvas, and then there is different palettes. And in these palettes, you can actually create your own compositions in there. And this was very interesting because, again, well, it's this kind of co creation with other people. And for instance, there was somebody who got all the sounds out. You know, and then you roll over, and then you 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 hear the sounds. But that's uh, that for for instance is a, a, a composition I never thought of doing. So that was also quite interesting how everybody was uh, relating and working with this. Um, just quickly to mention as well this work, Transient Self Portrait, which uh, uh, since I was presenting here with Serge, this is a project that uh, I did in Compiègne. Compiègne. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, with uh, a couple of students from a uh, search uh, group as well and is dealing with uh, two sonnets from Spanish sonnets from Goncora and Garcilaso and then is translating into three uh, different languages as well <coughs> and then I got a chapter about this book we about yeah about this work in the hashtag women take lead Happy International Women's Day, and you can have a look. It's, uh, uh, there is work in here from many, uh, JR as well, and Odile uh, have written a chapter in this book. And you can, you know, have a look and see if you, if you are interested in electronic literature and what we've been doing um, up till now. So, 
and this is another piece which uh, it was a site-specific work. Uh, I organized a small research group for a week and uh, um, Susana Josarova and myself uh, co um, uh, uh, curated an exhibition uh, which uh, it was repurposing in electronic literature and then as part of that then we worked together with uh, Christine Wilkes and Janine Nagy as well and we created this piece like in three or four days uh, researching on on the place which was uh, a, a tobacco, tobacco factory in Cosiche and uh, in this tobacco factory we found out it took us a while to, to get to what is it that we wanted to actually do obviously but we found out that um, there were like lots of women working in the tobacco factory and and then we thought that's it you know it's four of us it's, uh, it's, it was like a massive space of, I don't know how many meters, 50. And, and then we made a project all based on repurposing uh, some of the electronic literature works, like to do this work here, which is a generation of images. And then we also have sounds from the women that were working at that time in the factory, which uh, it was in Hungarian, German, and Slovak and English because we were there together as well as a group. So that is another area where you are immersed with the multilingual sounds and, in, and also with different kind of uh, lang um, words in different languages as well that were appearing in the space, you know, in different places. And then we also uh, mm, published this uh, manual of creative uh, manual for repurposing electronic literature and we have uh, yeah it includes part of the exhibition but also different essays by different people that we invited as well so these are all different ways of translations and I you know there are many other works obviously that I haven't mentioned but this one again is a, a, a translation of open data from the maritime databases and visualize, visualizing the, the roots of the vessels uh, and uh, you know the names of the actual vessels are also mapped to Wikipedia entries. So the first exhibition was in Hamburg in Germany and it's called, it's called Gateway to the World because that's the name of the actual port and, and you know this is something that to start with we did it as an app and then we have to, um, work, you know, we have to actually make it for the web because of the difficulties that we were talking about um, yesterday as well, you know, with apps and uh, the operating systems and everything. So then this one, everybody wanted to have their own, um, you know, ports. So I did one on Barcelona, which I did it in, uh, one was in Catalan and another version in Spanish. And and uh, and then uh, in Bremen and Plymouth and a whole other places and also in Ireland, but I also brought this one up because now I got um, you know I've been working for a while with uh, the National Centre for Geocomputation in the University of Ireland in Maynooth and uh, with the Multimodal Visualisation Research Group as well. So, and, and you know, we're going to work together into doing a, a real-time piece uh, with, uh, in multi-language, multilinguistic as well. So, I just move into the, the, the recent project and the Translating in Electronic Literature project that we're working at the moment with uh, Paris 8, Brown University, University of Coimbra in Portugal, Aarhus University in Denmark, and Kingston University. And I've been collaborating with, uh, you know, my, these colleagues and researchers for a year or so. And so we have come up with uh, some, um, let's say, levels of translations because Translation, as we've been discussing here, is usually considered as a process of translating from one language to another. But in program literature, translation has several dimensions. And so when software-dependent literature is translated, it can be separated into four 
uh, interrelated dimensions and uh, in the range from written, you know, from the written surface text to the way it is handled, generated and controlled by the layers of the interface and software. So, so here we got the translinguistic, the transcoding, which is translation between machine readable codes and translation between machine readable codes and human, human readable text, the transmedial, uh, between medial, the transcreation, translation as a compositional practice and as a shared creative practice. So I thought these, these dimensions were relevant for this presentation because they encompass as well the many layers that I just been mentioning, uh, or this kind of cross fertilization of languages, and that we find in the creation of electronic literature works. So this cross is not only between the natural languages, but also between modalities, the code and the aesthetics, and the co-creations and methodologies, like in the case the, of the poem that crossed the Atlantic as well. Um, which I will show in a minute, and um, and we're also, you know, by doing the, the the poem across the Atlantic, it also deals with many different discourses, which you know is a, a personal discourse, is also social, political, historical, artistic, and poetic. So you know, many of these works are, you know, they I was bringing them here because it has that kind of interlanguage you know, intermodality aspect, the, the kind of transcoding and everything, but at the same time, they're embedded with a lot of other means and cultural and social or political aspects as well. So, um, so yeah, so anyway, so I think I probably show you the work, but I just thinking about the transcreation aspect for me as a, as a uh, creator, um, you know, it's, it's almost like using this as a translation and practice-based creative methodology. And uh, I like to quote um, Bruce Archer when he says, there are circumstances where the best or only way to shed light on a process is to attempt to construct something or to enact something, calculate it, to explore, embody, or test it. And is this idea as a you know, as a creative director or as a creator, that the, the, you learning through that process and using the process of translation with all those different dimensions in the, in the production of the work, it's really interesting to see how they are all interconnected and how perhaps they, this can also be useful for other um, creators of electronic literature or, or critics as well. So I'll show you the, the Winnipeg, um, which is here. So for this work, you can see that, yeah? Um, the poem that crossed the Atlantic is, um, I work with a creative programmer, Alex Dupont, and uh, it is an interdisciplinary practice-based uh, artistic research, and uh, its aim was to create an interlinguistic, networked, interactive, online poetic narrative. So that was like a kind of challenge, and um, which is the poem, right? That's that's what I call the poem across the Atlantic, and the and then it was also this website, which is the Winnipeg and where readers are invited to add stories and to archive uh, as well them, their archive. And they simultaneously become part of the poem. So you, there is the archive here, you can add a story here, and this is the, the, the poem. And uh, I'll take you through that. Um, out. So then this work is actually rooted in a personal story, um, interlaced with uh, historical events of the Spanish uh, Civil War and uh, the Spanish and Chilean historical memory. So the narrative and background to this project is the rescue and evacuation of uh, more than 2,000 Spanish uh, Civil War exiles, including my own grandfather, from French concentration camps in the cargo boat, the Winnipeg, from the port of, you know, as you can see, from Peru here, 
and uh, uh, to France in Valparaiso, from France to Valparaiso in Chile, uh, in the 4th of August of 1939. So, and the Chilean Pablo Neruda organized this evacuation when he was Council of Immigration uh, officer, and then Pedro Aguirre Cerda was the president. So, there is still not enough knowledge about this event even, you know, uh, as there is in us about so many other atrocities anyway from many other civil wars as well. And um, so they form part of the hidden history and uh, that started coming uh, to light in recent years with the study of the, the, the historical memory, the, memor the memoria historica, yeah? So this work uh, brings up to light social and political issues and raise awareness as well of historical events uh, through hybrid forms of visual art, language, and technology. And concurrently, this work also reflects on uh, pertinent critical issues of migration, displacement, and the search for survival, so apparent in current uh, worldwide uh, events. And through the translation as a process, archiving historical events, and visual research and the gathering of data and personal stories are um, explored as cultural material and as a way to instigate new poetic uh, forms and online communication. Okay, so, so then we have uh, the, web, the website of the Winnipeg here. And uh, so you can have it in English, Spanish, or I can put it in English if you want. Okay, and so we have the Winnipeg, and these are the 2,000 and more um, mm, kind of uh, the, the, the people, you know, the, the exiles that were actually on the boat, and they, they are moving in this, uh, you know, delineating the kind of uh, area from the, of the Winnipeg trip. Um, then we have the Neruda uh, website where you have this kind of landscape where, uh, you know, the, the, the Winnipeg parted. And then this poem, which uh, uh, Pablo Neruda, when he saw uh, the, the Winnipeg about to leave, then he said he was quite touched, obviously, by, by this event. And he wrote, uh, the critics may erase all of my poetry, but this poem that today, okay. Today I remember nobody will be able to erase. And practically you go through this poem and you know it's impossible to kind of eradicate. So um, so it could be this could be like a kind of literary trope that maybe Noelia wants to chip in later. Uh, in literature and uh, and you know it's with, with the aim of engaging the reader as well. Um, we have the background and here is uh, Somebody was talking before about self-translation, and and this was uh, this is this is the whole story and how I came across you know my grandfather you know, online because I didn't know anything about this story. I only came across this story when I was actually researching on my visualization project, and then I put his name down and there he was here. So it was a bit of a shock in my living room. And um, so I wrote this story and I, I wrote it in English and I wrote it in Spanish and it was really interesting, this process of self-translation, it was making me write better in a way and, and it made me think about what is it that I have said in Spanish that I haven't said that in English or I have said things in English that I haven't said in Spanish and, and it made me reflect on the story and what is it that I really wanted to do and what is in, what was important in a way. So that was a really nice uh, realization for me. Uh, and then you had the, here you can submit your story. So there has been uh, people submitting some stories and some of them I have been uploading there myself as well. Um, and yeah, so, so, and these stories then you can send it they, they are part of the archive, but they also become part of the, the actual uh, multilinguistic project here. And here you can dive in and you find the, 
you might find a text in English, in Spanish or in uh, French. And the nice thing about it was, again, it was something that I really needed to think about as well, was, as you saw, you know, Erika, as you were saying before, you know, there is the translation in the, in the website, is the, the website in English, in French and in um, Spanish. But uh, with the poem, what I wanted is all of them together. You know, I have to think about it. I want, you know, everything in French in the French website and everything in English in the English website or, you know, and then I came back again to kind of my multilinguistic way of communicating with, which is what I am really, who I am. And, and I think that you have been mentioning this in many of your presentations this morning, but at the end of the day, that's, that's I, I mean, I think that the, the, as I will grow older and probably will come a point when I'll be <laughs> using and speaking in all these different languages because I won't remember one word in one language and I will remember in another language. And in some ways, since, you know, my work is a little bit like that, you know, so so you you, you have the, the phonetic sounds all coming together and it's the... So anyway, here you can actually dive in and and you go, you know, deeper and deeper and then you can actually click on a word and it's the whole kind of sea of letters and ametrayandome what a word, ametrayandome. Mm. So you can also click on ametrayandome and it might take you to another text that also has that word or, you know, and this is, again, testimonio de Ovidio, recuerdos. And if you kind of uh, start playing around with this, then you will see and it will come up sometimes and you dive in again into the story okay so yeah so we're finishing now so so yeah that was mainly the the uh, the whole thing that i had for this <laughs> presentation uh, yeah you can you can just uh, play by yourselves with them but thanks very much and uh, I, I yeah one thing that i wanted to say practically is that uh, looking at this work from the point of view of those kind of four modalities in a way it's been really interesting as critically analyzing the the, the different um, layers of meaning if you want so we'll leave it in there thank you okay thank you